Welcome to The Forum, a world of ideas from the BBC. I'm Quentin Cooper. True story. A long time ago, I studied artificial intelligence at university. Back then, lecturers and other AI experts often told me we were only a decade or so away from machines as intelligent as humans. Ten years later, when I went back, I was informed that we made huge strides and now we're only a decade away from machines as smart as cats. Another ten years, again, supposedly great progress, but this time the consensus was we were a mere decade from machines with the cognitive power of microbes. Now, that might seem a sign of failure, of hubris, discovering there's far more to our brains and our minds than even the most sophisticated silicon simulation can ever come close to. But the truth is that while we aren't even close to the kind of thinking machines that are a given of so much science fiction, no R2-D2s or replicants just yet, a different kind of artificial intelligence has permeated almost every aspect of our existence. In hospitals, AI monitors and diagnoses patients. In offices, software does accounts and vets job applications. And in our phones and computers, algorithms filter our searches and alter our world view. All this programming and processing power has been developed to help us. But is it also changing us? And as our machines learn, because we've designed them to, do we need to learn more about what happens when their logic is applied to our messy, complex, often illogical daily lives? On today's forum, we're asking how artificial intelligence influences real human intelligence. Does it support it, or warp it, or even undermine it? And ultimately, is AI something we really need? With me are three guests, uh, all people, no machines. I hope that won't be seen as signs of bias. Uh, Zubin Garamani is Professor of Information Engineering at the University of Cambridge, where he leads the Machine Learning Group. Digital anthropologist Lydia Nicholas is a senior researcher at the Innovation Foundation Nesta and particularly interested in AI's use in healthcare and government. And Kentaro Tayama is an associate professor at the University of Michigan in the US who began his career researching computer vision and multimedia, then co-founded Microsoft Research India. He's also the author of Geek Heresy, Rescuing Social Change from the Cult of Technology. So welcome to you all. I think we should probably just start by attempting to be clear about a couple of phrases and words that are likely to come up in the conversation. Um, Kentaro, could you possibly quickly take us through the differences between software and programs and algorithms? Uh, that's a great question. Well, software and programs, roughly they are the same thing. Um, and then algorithms are really the recipes that are in software and programs which uh, instruct computers on how to do things. Uh, they're often very complex um, instructions, but basically all it is is a recipe of exactly what to do at what time. Brilliant and nice and succinct. Now, Zubin, I mentioned you lead the machine learning group at, at Cambridge. How do machines learn and, and what can they learn and can't they learn? Take the example of uh, speech recognition on a phone, a smartphone. So you might wonder, how does that work? So one possibility would be that somebody wrote a very complicated set of rules for how to detect a particular word. But that's not really how these things work. You know, you couldn't sit down and write down a set of rules that would manage all sorts of accents and different pronunciations and so on. So the way these systems actually work is that you throw lots of data at them. So you get a computer program, an algorithm, that has many tunable knobs. These are called the parameters. And essentially you throw thousands or millions of hours of speech at them and the actual text that they're supposed to translate to. So it's mapping from the speech to the text translation. And then they start out by guessing, and every time they make a mistake, they tune their knobs so that it decreases the chance that they make that same mistake again. And by doing this over and over and over again, um, these algorithms learn to recognize speech. And that sort of same principle can be applied to images, to doing automated trading in a financial system, all sorts of examples. Yeah, and this is one of the things. You, you are the, amongst other things, you're also deputy director of the new Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence, based in Cambridge, but yeah. with partners around the world. And I guess what we're hinting at here is that maybe the future of intelligence isn't just the future of human intelligence. Well, absolutely. So um, although we're used to computers being these logical devices that do calculations, more and more we're getting machine learning systems that are acting in somewhat more similar ways by recognizing patterns in data. But um, they're still different because unlike humans, 
they can recognize patterns in, say, um, financial data or DNA sequences. I mean, humans evolved to have visual systems and auditory systems. We didn't evolve to recognize patterns in all sorts of other complex data. So we're generating forms of intelligence that are, although inspired by human learning, they're acting in very different ways. And I guess a watershed moment was nearly 20 years ago when uh, IBM's deep blue computer beat the uh, world chess champion Garry Kasparov. And this was meant to be, you know, chess was being a chess grandmaster was a pinnacle of intellectual achievement. But after that, we kind of began to recalibrate, didn't we? We kind of went, well, actually, yes, the computers can do that, but actually it couldn't really move the chess pieces. It can't go up a flight of stairs. Actually, these are the things that count. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that's interesting is that our definition of intelligence keeps shifting. Mm. Every time a computer does something, we say, oh, well, that's not really intelligence. <laughs> I think that's um, maybe a bit naive. Um, I think we are kind of living in a pre-Copernican view of intelligence. So Copernicus famously, you know, showed us that the universe didn't revolve around uh, planet Earth, right? And this was a huge, this had a huge impact on the sciences and religion and all these other things. Well, maybe, maybe the concept of intelligence doesn't revolve around human mm. intelligence. You know, maybe uh, we should be more broad-minded about what intelligence means. Maybe my thermostat and my iPhone are kind of intelligent. Right. We're being cognitively solipsistic, I think you might say, oh, as, well, as, well, yeah. as well. And you're a believer that the, the, uh, the benefits of AI far outweigh the, the downsides. Is that right? Well, absolutely. I mean, we are already living in a world where these AI systems are helping us in many ways. You know, we have systems for navigating around the world, for translating between languages, for you know, understanding medical data, you know, credit card fraud detection by banks. All of these technologies are using AI already, and many, many more examples of that. And do you have specific concerns that there's this sort of societal malware we're inadvertently uploading by this adoption of AI? Yeah, I mean, um, of course, um, any... Uh, AI researcher has to think about the, the consequences of, of the work. And the community as a whole is thinking very much about these concerns. And there are many of these concerns. There are legal concerns, like what happens when a self-driving car gets into an accident. There are concerns about the future of warfare. You know, the AI community is very uh, strongly generally opposed to using AI systems in warfare or lethal autonomous weapons. There are concerns about our sense of self and intelligence and so on. What's the future going to be like for, for people, our sense of self-worth as human beings, and also employment and you know inequality. I think this is a very important concern. Who's going to own these AI technologies? Is it going to benefit a few, putting other people out of a job? And we really need to you know be aware and design our... Uh, society and our technologies to benefit everybody. I mean, there are lots of other aspects of this as well. There's, the, there's the, the filter bubble that's been identified that if computers are actually affecting what we get in our news feeds, we all live in our own little private worlds. And then there's the de-skilling aspect you've touched yeah. upon here, that if machines are getting smarter and we're getting less smart, isn't it inevitable that they're going to take over more and more of our roles? Yeah, so the filter bubble is very interesting because in a sense, when people interact with, say, their news feed on Facebook... They're actually interacting with an algorithm that's deciding what they get to see based on what they've liked before. And um, that has a sort of self-reinforcing aspect, which means that, in a sense, the algorithm is kind of in control of the environment that you see. And I think we need to be aware of that, you know, do we want humans to stay in control or do we want them to live in bubbles uh, controlled by computers? I mean, clearly, people would have uh, strong opinions about that. Lydia, do you share these concerns? I mean, in that specific case, I think what's really important is to understand that the filter bubble there is not being controlled by people or by computers, but it's it's by people in either case. It's just that in one case, it's people that have decided to program a computer to create a system that serves the needs of advertisers, and they have decided that the overarching priority is to create a stream of news that will show me things that I like and thus will make me more responsive to any adverts that are filtered into that. So it's not necessarily the case of being controlled by humans or by computers, but about 
our environment as a whole becoming smarter and who is in control of how those smart in- environments are shaped. Kintara, are you, are you concerned that we're being technologically infantilized? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, I agree entirely with Lydia that the question is who is ultimately in charge of the technology? Um, I often think of you know advanced AI as being comparable to you know atomic weapons in comparison to the plastic toy guns we're playing with today. And uh, but unlike nuclear weapons, you know these um, advanced technologies are going to be in the hands of private corporations for the most part. And they have you know I used to work at Microsoft. I know exactly what it's like being inside a company. And you know they employees believe that it's their moral mission to increase shareholder value, to increase profits. And so, of course, they're going to cater to advertisers who are paying them, or uh, even in the case of consumers, you know, what exactly the consumers are willing to pay for as opposed to what they might think is best for themselves. And so the challenge, I think, is really ensuring that larger social and economic context. Um, I very much appreciate what Zubin is doing with the center in terms of trying to make sure that we design the technologies appropriately. But I think this is a situation where it's not just the design of technology, but the design of our society that needs to be paramount. Um, And if we get that right, then there's a better chance that the technology will also serve us in the way that we would like. Zubin, just before I spend a bit more time with Kintaro and what he's been doing, is there any chance that we're being overly negative here, that actually the, the net result of all this isn't going to be mass unemployment and misery? It's going to be a AI-powered utopia where we all lead lives of luxury and our machines do all our thinking for us? Well, um, I think that if society prepares itself, we can continue to reap benefits as we have. And for the large part, all of these technologies have helped us in many ways. We can do things much better. Our life standard is much better than in the past. Um, And, uh, you know, let's take the example of self-driving cars. Uh, Over a million people die every year in road accidents if we build self-driving cars. Not only can we prevent those deaths, but we can have a much more energy-efficient transport network. So examples like that abound in medicine and energy and all the things that we should care about. And so um, it's really up to us how we use these tools. We need to, you know, make them work for us. Two aspects of that. One, of course, is for some people it's completely counterintuitive that machines will be safer on the roads than humans. And secondly, I'm going to imagine that these driverless cars are going to be at the expensive end of the market, so aren't we going to skew the road deaths towards the people who've got less money because they can't afford to be in the safer driverless cars? Well, um... You know, to to answer the first point, I think there is a a lot of evidence now that, you know, we can equip cars to have senses that humans don't have. I don't have eyes in the back of my head. I can't communicate with my brain. My brain can't communicate telepathically with other cars on the road and so on. So there's really no reason technologically to believe that cars couldn't be safer than humans. In fact, at some point, humans might be the, you know, the weak link on the road. So that's the technological point. But then, uh, you know, who is this going to benefit? I think this is a really important question. People will, you know, probably uh, lose their jobs in many sectors. Technology has always done that. Agriculture, you know, changed the nature of society. Industrial Revolution did that again. This could happen quickly. And so we need to prepare ourselves for it. We need to retrain people. We need to maybe create universal basic income. Maybe, you know, there's societal ways of trying to solve these problems. Okay, lots of threads and strands and stray bits of code we might want to pick up on later, but I want to go talk now to a bit more to Professor Kentaro Tayama. Now, I mentioned you you began your career working on computer vision in the US, then you co-founded Microsoft Research India, spent five years developing educational technology for use in India in classrooms around the world. Somewhere along the way, you stopped believing that whatever the problem, technology is the solution. You now describe yourself as a a recovering technoholic. So what happened? Right. So uh, as you mentioned, I began my career thinking that, you know, in general, more technology and better technologies would help improve um, society in various ways. And in India, I was particularly focused on efforts to alleviate poverty. Uh, Education was one of our focuses. And one thing that we found was that In many rural government schools, you would find a situation where multiple kids were huddled around a single computer because there were not enough uh, PCs to go around. And so we tried an innovative solution in which we basically allowed every child to plug in a mouse for themselves. Uh, There were multiple cursors on the screen, differently colored, and the children immediately understood this and uh, liked it. 
Um, but when we try to take this idea, which we found in lab tests to be uh, as good for each child as if they had a computer to themselves, um, we found that we consistently run into problems of uh, school administration, uh, lack of uh, sufficient budget, um, teachers not having sufficient training in technology, and so on and so forth. So effectively, we had a great technology, um, but in the end, the roadblock that we hit was of poorly implemented schools. And um, over the course of my time in India, I've found that this kind of exact same kind of problem occurred not just in education, but in healthcare, where you could have, again, great technologies, but if the health institutions were not delivering on their mission, uh, it didn't make a difference what kind of technology you gave them. Or to improve democracy and governance, you could have, again, great technology, but if the underlying system was somehow corrupt or inefficient, uh, it did not make a difference how good the technology was. Kintar, I mean, I've worked with the charity Computer Aid International. I've been into schools in, in Kenya. I've seen the excitement when teenagers are being given their first access to a computer and a mouse for the first time. But are you saying that unless there is proper IT support and committed teachers, that in a very short amount of time, those children will get no benefits? Exactly. So I would say that even more than proper IT support, it's really the committed teachers and the committed administrators that are uh, critical. And, you know, there's a lesson in that for just society overall, which is to say, you know, we can design the best technologies in the world, but unless society as a whole is clear about what those technologies are for and uh, clear on its overall objectives, um, the technology will end up either not being effective at causing the positive change we, we are interested in or possibly lead to unintended consequences that may be negative. AI might be part of the problem here, but isn't it also potentially part of the solution if we add the ability to this teaching technology to, to learn and adapt and, and personalise so that it fits the needs of the individual pupils? Couldn't that potentially transform education for rich and poor? It's possibly a part of a solution. But again, if you can't ensure that there is universal, high-quality adult supervision in every educational context, I would say that even, again, the best uh, technologies aren't uh, going to solve the solution. And we can actually see this even with the history of educational technology in the United States. Um, and in fact, even just general digital technologies in the United States. Uh, so over the last 40 years, you know, we've had a, you know, basically a golden age of digital innovation. And yet during that same time, we have not seen a decline in the rate of poverty in the United States. We have not seen, uh, if anything, political polarization has grown up. Uh, inequality has skyrocketed. And so uh, on the one hand, yes, great technologies can do great things, but almost always what happens is the rich get richer. They benefit more from the technology because the technology amplifies the advantages they already have. And as a recovering technoholic, do you, do you think these problems stem largely from the AI and the technology and the people who develop them? Or is it, is it more from the, the, the faith, the sometimes blind faith we place in them to bring about positive change? I think it's a combination of things. Um, and to be honest, I think we are all, as a society, individually also complicit in that, you know, on the one hand, we love these new technologies. We love the new gadgets. Uh, we're often willing to ignore the negative sides because we find that uh, what they give us is um, beneficial. Um, but I think we need to be a little bit more careful. We can't be blasé about the potential negative impacts just because there are many examples of um, positive impact. Zubin Garamani, from, from what... Kentaro is saying AI and technology, at least in education, seem to either have little impact or actively make things worse. Can AI help solve any of this? Um, I, I would certainly agree with Kentaro that, you know, technology alone isn't going to solve anything and it, there needs to be the, the infrastructure around, uh, you know, society to benefit from it. But on the other hand, um, all of these technologies are designed to make... Um, essentially all of our activities more efficient. So the more AI technologies we have, the more, you know, we as a whole society can operate more efficiently. So if we can learn to redistribute that efficiency, then certainly people will benefit. And, you know, we can choose as a society to benefit the, the people that are most disadvantaged. Um, but that's, a, that's not a technological solution alone. Kentaro, I mean, you've claimed that although we, we usually embrace technology as being a, a means of bridging inequalities, it more often acts like a jack, widening them further. Absolutely. So with educational technologies, I mean, we already see this today. Um, you know, well-educated, wealthy parents 
what they are really seeking is the highest quality adult supervision for their children. And of course, those schools may also have fancy computers, but the computers are secondary. Um, you know, with fancier and fancier technology, you can imagine that, uh, again, it will be the world's elite that have the best access to the best technologies. And, you know, the people who are currently poor and less educated will end up being able to, you know, afford the ones that turn your child into a duck. You know, it's all kinds of uh, these disparities which are fundamentally in society itself. Unless we address those, uh, it doesn't make a difference how good the uh, technology is. Lydia Nicholas, we'll get on to your own particular experience with healthcare and governance after the break. But from what you've heard there, does that chime with your own experience? I mean, I would build on the issue of education and AI with specifically the idea of uh, the encroachment of AI into education carries the risk of training children or training people being educated to be machine readable, to provide outputs that are easily marked and understood by algorithms. Now, there are a lot of companies that offer services that check pl for plagiarism and for repetition and so on uh, within, within essays. And these have been developed to the point that they can now mark and are used to mark in America college-grade essays for uh, genre, style and content. And that encourages uh, the people that are writing to those tests to m write essays that are readable by those algorithms, that don't show that kind of strange creative flair, that don't attack the question in a different way, and to think and to d deliver content that is machine readable. Now, if we're trying to train a generation that is going to have to collaborate with machines and work uh, with machine intelligence, obviously what we want is to develop skills that are uniquely or particular to humans, as opposed to making them more and more machine-like or training them that that is the way to... Yeah, we're, getting, we're encouraging convergence rather than divergence. Exactly. And so if you have skills that have been taught to you by an algorithm, it's going to be much harder for you to out-compete that algorithm uh, further down the line. Kentaro? You can really tell what uh, technology company executives really think about technology when you consider where they send their uh, children to school. Um, you know, when they have their marketing hats, of course, it's, you know, technology is fantastic and we should have more of it in our educational system. But many of the same executives send their kids to schools, often private Waldorf schools that ban electronic technology until the eighth grade. Uh, the schools also ask the parents to limit uh, exposure to electronic technology at home. And so that tells you something about uh, what those parents know. I mean, these are people who completely understand the technology uh, and push it to consumers whenever possible, but they're trying to withhold it from their own children. Today, we've been turning our limited human brains to the strengths and shortcomings of artificial intelligence, exploring how machine thinking diverges from human cognition and the problems those differences can cause. In short, we're attempting to answer the question, why do we need AI? With me are Professor Kentaro Tayama, co-founder of Microsoft Research India, Zubin Garamani, Professor of Information Engineering and leader of the Machine Learning Group at Cambridge University, and for now we're going to focus on our third guest, digital anthropologist Lydia Nicholas, particularly interested in AI's use in healthcare and governance. Are these areas where AI has had a substantive impact? So one of the issues that you're getting in healthcare is that artificial intelligence is extremely good at uh, bounded problems, at problems where you can see the edge of the issue. Because AI does not learn about the whole world, it learns about data sets. Uh, and, that is uh, its whole world. Yeah, so we, we've discussed how they have different sensory kinds of inputs than us. But that means that they, they struggle with ideas of context or with uh, what might seem common sense to us. So they're doing extraordinarily well in things like medical imagery. So if we look at radiology, one of the, the key things at the moment is that there is a global shortage of radiologists. People are waiting a very, very long time for their x-rays, their CT scans to be looked at and tested for different signs of disease. Now, AI is very, very good at those kind of problems and so it can tear through the thousands and thousands of images that are produced uh, Right, when, spot patterns, spot can, anomalies. Yeah, they can spot patterns. So you're seeing this in, like, that's some of the most exciting stuff that's going on at the moment in diagnostic in those kind of, in those areas. Now, it gets more problematic and you begin to see the limits and differences between AI and human intelligence when you try and look at problems that are more 
connected to the outside world. So there was one particular project where they were trying to work out how to triage patients with pneumonia. Are they likely to have complications, in which case they need to be given a, a bed in a hospital or even escalated to intensive care? Or do they get treated as an outpatient because they're likely to be OK? Now, using an AI system to try and work out where those patients should head, the system was found to be incredibly effective uh, at working out exactly who was likely to suffer complications, except for one extremely strange quirk, which was that it was telling the doctors to send home anyone that had asthma. Now, this was incredibly dangerous because somebody yes. with asthma who has pneumonia is very likely to suffer from complications. That reflected the fact that in the training data, the data that the AI had learned from, uh, it had been hospital policy to send anyone that had asthma and pneumonia immediately to intensive care. And so that policy was so successful that those people very rarely developed complications and they tended to go home very healthy and fine. So, so it correlated the asthma with a good outcome exactly. and therefore thought that they were in exactly. safer. So it didn't understand the context within which previous decisions had been made. So that's where we're beginning to see the limits of AI. Zubin Garamani, this is where we need to bring you in as our machine learning expert. Is, is this a potential pitfall of the way machines learn that they're great at finding these links and patterns what they can't really do is kind of zoom back and see the big picture yeah absolutely i mean our ai and machine learning systems are only as good as the data that you throw at them and as lydia has described this uh, this excellent example with the asthma and pneumonia correlations in the data might not uh, correspond to patterns that uh, you should act on in a particular way so this is a problem that's known as data bias. The, bi the data that's being collected is biased in a particular way, and it can occur in all sorts of settings, like, you know, if you train your self-driving car on sunny California roads, it won't work in, you know, rainy uh, British roads. Yeah. Or, um, you know, if you're uh, doing something criminal justice as well, looking at patterns of parole decisions, then, you know, you could be getting your AI system to internalise biases that humans have, have generated. So, Lydia, it's probably worth saying, I mean, there have been identified problems using these algorithms in the criminal justice system. Yeah, so a lot of these cases come from the US because uh, they obviously have... They spend quite a lot of money on their criminal justice system and they've got less in terms of data protection laws. There's one case in particular where judges who are deciding on sentencing and probation are being given threat scores, judging the likelihood that that person will commit crimes in the future. Now, not only were they found to be not that much more predictive than a coin toss when it came to violent crime, about 53% correct, they were found to be wrong in different ways for different uh, ethnic groups. So uh, white people were much more likely to be judged to be less likely to commit a crime and then go on to commit a crime. But uh, black members of the community were likely to be judged as high risk for committing another crime, but were less likely to actually commit another crime. So not only are they not particularly accurate, but they are also racially biased. Sue, but is this a key detail? We can only train, obviously, using historical data, and if there are flaws in the historical data, then there are flaws in the training. Oh, absolutely. I would completely agree with that. A problem, then, is, uh, firstly, that we as humans and culturally at the moment seem very inclined to accept the decisions from machines as being true. The computer says yes, it, it must be true because these are hard numbers, it's not a human opinion. I mean, this is a very important point of this, and there is a famous sketch in an old BBC comedy series, Little Britain, where the, whatever the request, however benign, however mm -hmm. uh, amenable it is, the, computer, the answer comes back, computer says no. And, of course, and it's, the implication is that would be much more trusted than any human being saying no. Yeah. It's something that, in well, in the sketch, it's something that they can't overrule. Mm. Uh, but in this case, it's something that people simply understand is probably correct because mm. computers are lovely and certain and they, they've got these complicated numbers inside them and are much more impressive than our squishy brains. So you've got, you've got that cultural bias. Um, you also have the problem of black boxing, which is that many versions of artificial intelligence are extremely difficult, if not impossible, for human minds to really comprehend their inner workings. So neural nets in particular can operate in higher dimensional mathematical space in that we just can't intuitively get our heads around. So I see that these, you know, 80, 200, 150 
different data points have gone in and I see that a threat score of a person that I've got to make a parole decision about that threat score, which might be a single number between 1 and 10, that that comes out. I've got no idea how that has been weighted. I've got no idea what sort of biases might be in there. There's no real way to work out exactly where like something went wrong. And what you can't even tell is, hypothetically, let's say this particular piece of AI makes the right decision 99 times out of 100, but if you're that 100th parolee and that machine mm. has made the wrong decision and because it's a bit of black box AI and you can't interrogate that decision, that is not justice. Well, it's extremely difficult um, for, for that reason, but also, say, for reasons of legislation and trade secrets. So a lot of the time those algorithms are proprietary, they're, they're owned by companies, and they are extremely difficult to challenge in court. So it's very hard to explain that this system was biased against me and therefore we need to do something about that. Now, Zubin, as I understand it, this is something that you're working on indirectly in that trying yeah. to get a machine learning but that also gives its, explains its uh, logic, not on the side of the paper, but in plain English. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I completely agree with Lydia that this is, a, this is a challenge and the technology isn't mature yet in the sense that we need uh, machine learning and AI systems that are aware of their own uncertainty, that can tell us when they know something and when they're not sure. We need systems that can tell the difference between correlation and causation, which is related to the which, asthma. Yeah, which it's humans a, often can't. <laughs> you know, um, in and fact, we should we, probably probably clarify. I mean, a, a classic example of confusing correlation with causation is that you know the rooster crows just before sun up, so the rooster causes the, the the sun to rise. It's it's mixing up what cause and effect. Right, right. And my favorite example like that is the seatbelt sign and turbulence in airplanes. Right, the seatbelt sign comes on right before turbulence. It doesn't cause the turbulence, <laughs> but. Um, the other thing that we need is this um, black box problem. We need AI systems that are um, not black boxes that we can understand that maybe explain themselves, that explain why they've made a particular decision to us. And that is something I'm working on. I'm working on a system, uh, we call it the automatic statistician, that will analyze data, it'll find patterns in the data, and then it will actually try to explain in plain English with plots and, you know, uh, in a full report that should be readable by somebody technical but not a, a real expert, why it's found those, uh, those patterns. But isn't there a slight element of catch-22 to this? If we get this explainable AI that can take us to something we can understand, that means it's something that would be within our brains to understand and maybe some of the things these machines can do are beyond what our brains can understand. Um, yeah, I think there is a really interesting tension there between getting our systems to be explainable and transparent mm -hmm. versus getting our systems to perform very well. So mm -hmm. there's a trade-off. But I think there is a lot of hope to have systems that perform very, very well. And most of the time, they can give us good explanations for what they did. And sometimes maybe they can't explain what they did. But actually, I would argue humans are not very explainable. <laughs> you may be making decisions and, you know, I might ask you, why did you do that? And I might not understand your explanation. You yes. might not even know your reasons why. I have no idea anything. why I'm going to ask the next question, but I know <laughs> I'm going to ask it to, to, to Lydia. I mean, AI is here to stay, so do we need to develop versions of it that complement and support human decision-making rather than supplant it and are impenetrable? We need to both work on the explainability of artificial intelligence, but we also need to work on culture and education and understanding of probabilistic outcomes, because most of the time an AI will give you an answer that isn't yes or no. It will say, I'm 80% certain, or this person's threat score is 2 out of 10, which doesn't mean, uh, as the human brain wants to jump to, that like if it's 80%, then it's certain to happen. <laughs> if it's 2 out of 10, then it's absolutely fine. But there's also the the issue of interface. When you start using artificial intelligence in government and in providing services to people, you need to be able to design the interaction between person and machine so that the person that is providing a service, they're not simply repeating the thing that the machine has said, but that the intelligence is being used to extend human expertise. Kentaro, isn't this one of the one of the real difficulties here? Is that whatever the noble goals of those developing and monitoring AI, and whatever caveats we say need to be there, it's likely, isn't it, that it's going to be just widely adopted as a cheaper replacement for human expertise, and and used in a in a simplistic way. 
I think you're right about that. Um, again, you know, I think we are living in a world in which the powerful forces are often uh, beyond our understanding and beyond our reach uh, as average citizens. And they make decisions that are not necessarily in the public good. And to the extent that that continues to happen, basically artificial intelligence is yet another extremely powerful tool that they can use to further their ends while neglecting those of the public good. Zubin, I mentioned right at the start that back when I studied AI, we thought we were only a short time away from computers that could uh, think like humans. Instead, all these years later, we, we have we ended up with humans thinking more like machines in order to avoid these computer says no scenarios, Lydia's honor, in order to pass these tests? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very interesting question. Certainly, you know, I think humans are very adaptable and we keep adapting to the tools that we have. It changes our environment. Um, in certain ways, as we were describing before in the test-taking, Lydia was mentioning this example, you can have people sort of adapting themselves to passing the test that the computer is marking, let's say. But I still want to come back to the fact that in many other ways, these algorithms, these computers, AI systems, and so on, they're giving us superhuman abilities, abilities that our ancestors wouldn't have dreamed of. So we need to make sure that we keep benefiting from these technologies, but we also share that benefit broadly across society and, and societies around the world. Kintaro, we began by talking about the, the hubris of AI, of, of thinking we'll be able to develop something that can think like we can. In the end, should all these attempts and all these difficulties lead to the realisation that actually there are these differences between machine logic and human thinking, and actually we need to appreciate more what an incredible piece of kit the human being is rather than getting so excited about the latest phone. I think that's definitely true. Um, you know, from a technological standpoint, I actually don't think that, you know, it is going to be that long before we have artificial intelligence systems that seem, you know, virtually indistinguishable from human and in many ways super intelligent, as uh, Zubin was saying. I think the risk is really that we are going to undergo a phase in which, you know, these super intelligent machines will be, they'll be machine savants. They'll be spectacularly good at some things and yet lack the kind of moral common sense that, you know, we expect of uh, adult human beings. And so the question is, how can we ensure, you know, how, will we go through this process of guiding the technology in a way that it thinks it's, you know, common sense that you should not issue commands that hurt human beings or which cause some human beings to suffer at the hands of others? Uh, Lydia, mm -hmm. are we at risk of getting a bit too far ahead of myself? I bought, I bought a new bicycle online just a month ago, and ever since I've been bombarded by adverts trying to sell me bicycles. And I think, well, this isn't very intelligent of this system. I'm the last person who wants a bicycle. I've got one. Yeah, well, that comes back to the exact two points mm -hmm. about uh, about artificial intelligence as challenges that we've spoken about, mm -hmm. that it only understands the data that it sees, and quite rightly so, your purchase of the bicycle is private. <laughs> so it only saw that you visited the shop. It didn't see that you then actually bought one. There's that, and there's the fact that they are controlled by, to the in the majority of cases, commercial platforms that want to sell you things. I mean, Amazon, for instance, is using this this tool to decide uh, if you are likely to buy something, then it will already start moving the package towards a delivery centre near you. It won't post it quite to your address, but it will begin the process of sending you it because it knows you are very, very likely to press buy and it wants to be as quick as possible. If that kind of technology, if that kind of intelligence could be used to get medical equipment to people, if it could be used to get the right kind of support to people who have special educational needs, that have disabilities, then even with the present level of AI, we could be living in a much happier and, and more inclusive world. So our key problem is both narrowness, the narrow, powerful beam of AI has to be supplanted by the human ability to steer that torch, but also the fact that at the moment these technologies are being used brilliantly and with great creativity by people that want to sell us things. And we could be doing much better on both counts. 
OK, that is it. My thanks to machine learning expert Zubin Garamani, digital anthropologist Lydia Nicholas, and for warning us to beware of geeks bearing gifts, Kentaro Tayama. Now, if you agree or disagree with what they have said or have intelligent thoughts of your own to add, we would love to hear them. You can get in touch with us via Facebook and you can listen to other editions of the forum at your leisure by going to bbcworldservice.com forward slash forum, assuming we haven't put you off ever going near a computer or smartphone again. And for our bird song as usual to end the program here's not ai but a golden eye a barrow's golden eye recorded at the wonderfully named risky creek in british columbia canada <laughs>